The following organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series. There it is! Yeah, I see it. Oh my gosh. Okay, you're gonna need to wear this today. Same reason you're wearing those steel-toed things. Because we're headed into that place. An industrial sand mine to decode the science and impacts of what really goes on there. And because we need real answers. Look, there are two kinds of scientists. Pseudoscientists who get an idea in their head, then look for little information to support it. Duh. Then are the real scientists, the ones who investigate the science first and investigate the facts. Which one do you want to be? Real, of course. That's why we'll be recording and asking questions about the stuff that really matters. You know, what's the impact on our environment? <laughs> oh, yep. Yeah, the signal feed's coming in now. Whoa, that right there is not your schoolyard sandbox. G good luck, guys. We need investigative answers as we head into the outdoors. tour while I dig deeper into this industrial sand thing. You know, it kind of looks like they're mining something precious down there. Hmm. It's just sand, right? Let's see what they use it for. Uses for industrial sand. Silica. Silica? SiO2? Hey, that's quartz! The most common silica crystal and the second most common mineral on Earth. But why would that be so valuable? Okay, use is coming online. Whoa! Chill on the feet! Oh! They want clean quartz sand. Almost 95% silica. No wonder! They make all kinds of glass with it. From car windshields, to light bulbs, to glass jars, to test tubes. Guess that's legit. And they use it in making metal castings from car engine blocks to sinks and faucets. They even use it in making the metal alloys that they pour into sand molds. Didn't figure that. Chemical production? Hold on, it's sand. Oh yeah, silica-based chemicals for making stuff from cleaning products to fiber optics. Huh. Construction materials that build our homes and cities, the roadways connecting them, sealants, caulks, paints, coating, ceramic products, toilets, tableware, floor and wall tile, drinking water filtration, golf courses, athletic fields, and <gasps> oil and gas recovery? You know, frac sand. Are you getting all this back at Mission Control? Got sick of fits coming in now. But I'm wondering if you'd be getting any of it at all without the silica sand. No cell phones, no cameras, no truck. We might have to rethink some of this. Okay, we get the picture. We'd be living in huts eating bugs without that sand. Who would have thought? So yeah, we admit we need it. It's important, it's valuable. So sure, they have to mine it somewhere, but why here? Beaches and deserts have tons of sand. That's what the scientists are for. The sand deposit here is dominated by very pure quartz sandstone. The abundance of the round sand grains is what makes it so unique. It may look like stuff you see in a sandbox, but Jamie explained why it's so rare. Well, first, because of the silicon oxygen atoms that make up pure silica quartz, it's one of nature's hardest minerals. And after a billion years of being churned in an ancient sea, all the impurities got washed away while the sand grains became rounded and sorted into these uniform spheres. 
This rare silica sand layer was deposited in an ancient sea 500 million years ago. It used to be right here in parts of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Illinois. And because this particular sandstone is only exposed at the surface in some places, it makes sites like Tunnel City very important. It's hard to believe that nature can make something that cool and perfect. Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about when I say impurities? No. See the different colors in there? The, the blacks and the oranges and the yellows? Yeah. yeah. They're just different types of minerals. That's what we consider impurities. The silica is the very, very clear round greens that you can tell. Uh, okay. We take off the first 80 feet, roughly, and set it aside for later reclamation. After that, we mine the next 60 feet. Of that 60 feet, only about half of it meets our specifications. Oh, sorry, Mission Control's calling. We gotta go. Sorry. Ah, oh, another hazard of being a sand miner. Nah, just another day at the prehistoric beach. Coming up next, do you think they use dynamite to blow up the rocks to get to sand? Let's see. Don't go away. There's more Into the Outdoors. And now back, Into the Outdoors. All right, so somebody needs to mine this industrial sand, and they need to mine it here. But exactly how do they mine it? Yeah, but how do they impact the environment when they mine it? Well, that depends on how they mine it, doesn't it? I suppose so, but... Oh, forget it. You ask your questions and I'll ask mine. This is where it all begins. The first step we do in mining is we have to remove the trees and topsoil. The trees are either they're hauled off to the lumber mill or turned into mulch. The topsoil's placed in a pile where we use that later in our reclamation. From there, we remove the dirt and rocks that's on top of the sandstone. We call that overburden. Overburden. We come in with scrapers and dozers, and we break up that material, and we haul it off. Then we're, we go after the sandstone, which is a 60-foot seam. From there, we use bulldozers to push the sand into piles. Time out. I thought this stuff was rock. This material isn't packed together as, as tight as other areas, so the sand grains aren't heavily cemented like they are in other formations. So the dozer will rip down the face first and then back back up and push it into piles. Those scoopy things look pretty busy. Well, we call those front end loaders. And those have 10 yard buckets and they go all day back and forth to load that sand onto the conveyor belts. 10 yards, you talking 10 cubic yards? Yeah, 10 cubic yards. And that's about 14 tons of material per bucket load. Whew, that's a sandbox full. We mine about 20 to 25 acres a year, and we have about 20 acres of active reclamation behind us. So this continually moves. So it's a constantly evolving operation? Yes. As we progress ahead, we reclaim behind ourselves. Where's it all going? Well, it's all going down there to that big jaw crusher. You can see we load it up on a conveyor belt, and it goes to the plant. That's, that's all cool technology, guys, but I think you missed something. No, you can't see it very well. That's why it's a potential problem. It's silica dust, and if you spend too much time inhaling it, it can cause silicosis. You know, lung damage. Gotcha, we're on it. <clears throat> How come you didn't tell us about the silica dust? Got something to hide? Absolutely not. I think you need to see some cool technology. Up here you'll see a weather station and then our fugitive dust monitors that we are required to have at our site by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. The weather station will collect information on the direction of the wind, the speed of the wind, and also the temperature. That information is used to calibrate the information that the dust monitor collects as well. So we've got weather stations upwind and weather stations downwind, and then the monitors pick up the dust from either direction. We can utilize that information to know if we're generating any dust that's adding to the atmosphere. How much have you really found out? Well, this monitor has been running before we even started mining here to collect background information so that we could compare it to when we are actually running. 
We collect data every six day, which is on a regular schedule that everyone does so that we can compare the information to mines across the state. So that's all pretty cool, but I just need to know, have you been generating some dust? Well, we can go on the website and see the data, which shows the dust measured is very similar to regional background levels, and 100% of the data is well below the national limit that protects air quality. Not only that, do you hear that? Hear what? Exactly. The mine is just down there below the hill. You can't hear it. Oh, so the sound doesn't escape either. Well, there's no dust here, but what about back at the site? Let's go take a look. Well, you saw the water truck running earlier? Oh, yeah. The water truck was keeping the dust down. So when these front end loaders run back and forth from the face, we have the water truck come in that keeps dust down. Uh, there's another type of dust that we need to monitor for. It's occupational dust. And that's important because that's what's generated inside the plant. Our workers can be exposed to that. You see that big tube there that's coming down that looks like grasshopper legs? That's our low velocity dust collection system. It's attached to everything you see in here. And it creates a vacuum that sucks up all the dust so the workers don't get exposed to it. OK, it looks cool, but how do you know it really works? Well, we monitor our employees with dust pumps. There's little pumps that the employees wear for their whole shift. Then that's sent away to a special laboratory that analyzes it for silica dust. OK, so they've passed the air quality checks. But there's a lot more going on there that can also impact the environment. Like all that water they use? Come on, that's got to be an issue. Oh, I guess they really do have a water cycle here. We're going to find this out. Coming up next, a serious investigation about the impacts of using all that water. Don't go away. There's more Into the Outdoors. And now back, Into the Outdoors. So far, we've decoded the science behind the usage of industrial sand. Then, environmentally, we looked at the impact on air quality and the technology they use to control. But look at all this water they're using. That's got to be impacting that part of the environment. You guys on the trail of all that water? Yeah, we are. And just like the water cycle in nature, this place kind of has its own water cycle. First, it's got to come from somewhere. And the wells look pretty huge, too. No tell me how they affect the aquifer. You know, the ground water supply below the ground that we can't see. Time to find out. Just like nature has a water cycle, we have our own water cycle here. And it starts with this pump. What you can't see here is this well goes down into the aquifer, and that's where our water cycle starts. Before any water was pulled out of the aquifer, there was a hydrological study done. And we have three of these wells placed over three and a half miles apart to minimize the impact on the aquifer. We also have monitoring wells, and that's important because we need to know if we're having an impact on that aquifer. So what are the results really showing you? They're showing us that we don't have a sustained impact on the aquifer. So we only need to run these pumps maybe every two or three months because we recycle the majority of our water here. We're only pumping 150 gallons a minute, but the plant uses 15,000 gallons a minute. And we're able to do that because we can recycle our water. Although that building doesn't look like much, it filters 99% of our water, and it does it by using thickeners, filter presses, and vacuum belts. So what are we gonna see in that building? Well, one really cool thing you're gonna see in that building is a vacuum belt. And so you're gonna see a wet sand and water mix on one side, and by the time it gets to the end of the belt, it'll be dry. So it allows the water to come through, but it keeps the sand on top. So what are those thickeners? Thickeners allow all the clays and sediment in that water to drop out, and it thickens it into more of a mud. From there, that mud will get pumped into what we call filter presses, and those work by compacting that mud in between cloths at a really high pressure, and the water is able to leak out. And when you're done, you have a cake. It takes all the mud and slime out of the water, makes it pure again, so we can pump it back to our process. 
So you protect the groundwater, that's cool. Well, what about the surface water? I see erosion right over there. Yeah, fess up. Well, none of that leaves the site. This site is internally draining. So all that water and erosion you were worried about in the mine site, that's all collected. And it leaves that area, but it ends up back here. This is the end point. This is where we allow it to seep back in. So this is the surface water, the rainwater we catch. When this seeps back in, it's cleaned by the rocks. So we're actually recharging part of the aquifer with the storm water that we collect. We already know from other investigations that the sustainability of something needs to conclude the three R's. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. And by the looks of their water cycle, they checked all three R's in that mining operation. Now for the biggie. They have to be impacting the landscape with all that land they're tearing up. No way around it. If you dug out all the sand in your sandbox, you'd have a big hole. So when they're done with this place, there's going to be a really huge hole, right? Wrong! They can't do that, can they? Hey guys, ask them why they're trying to conceal their mine in a hole. So as you can tell, mining and reclamation happen continuously. You mine and then fill topsoil and reclaim with vegetation. But why is it in a hole? Yeah, got something to hide? Well, it is kind of in a hole and yeah, we are hiding it, but in a good way. This is a rural community and we wanted to maintain the rural landscape. Well, before we even start mining on the site, we do wildlife and habitat surveys to understand what's here. And once we understand what's here, we work the understanding of those species into our reclamation plan. It's reviewed by local, state agencies, and even the public before we can even start mining. It only looks like a lot of weeds on a hill, right? But Jamie explained that what you can't see is the first step of reshaping the landscape. They use sophisticated computer programs, along with GPS autopilots in their bulldozers, to reshape the land into natural hills and contours. Then it's time to plant. We come through and plant grasses to establish the soils to prevent erosion. And a few years later, once the grasses are established, we come back in and plant trees. So eventually, after 10 to 20 years, we'll have a pine oak barren similar to what was here before we started mining. And you end up not being able to tell what's been mined and what hasn't. But even with the restoration program, there's still a lot of unanswered questions about the impacts on the other parts of the ecosystem. Yeah, like, what about the wildlife? Go to intotheoutdoors.org to learn about science in your classroom. Next, we finally zero in on the impacts of the living parts of the ecosystems and nearby communities. Oh yeah. And now back into the outdoors. Up until now, we focused on the sand mine's impacts on the abiotic factors of the ecosystem. Those can affect the rest of the ecosystem. You know, the living parts or biotic factors. And if we really care about the environment, we need to focus on the living things, like wildlife and, yes, even us humans. When you disturb a landscape, you can't help but to impact everything that lives on the landscape. It's the lasting impacts that we need to explore. And I can't imagine how technology or engineering could help restore wildlife. This should be good. Come on. So see, these are all flowers here, here. We work the understanding of those species into our reclamation plan. For example, we found out that this area is known for Kerner blue butterflies. So what we did was we planted wild lupin, which is a plant that the Kerner blue butterflies feed off of. And we've actually seen Kerner blue butterflies come into our restoration areas more than what was here before we started mining. When we came out here and looked at the reclamation areas and actually found some, uh, it, was, it was incredible. All the hard work actually paid off. Well, we've been working with the Wildlife Habitat Council to increase the number of flower species that we use in our seed mix to attract more pollinators to the area, since it's so important. We've seen lots of different species of honeybees, hummingbirds, wasps, moths, and lots of butterflies. OK, 
Okay, I admit I'm a bird watcher and I'm super amazed on how many bluebirds you guys have here. <laughs> I know, isn't it great? Yeah, how did you guys get them all here? Well, we've been working with the Wisconsin Bluebird Association to build houses and place the bird houses in locations that the bluebirds will use and nest in. We put up over 18 bird houses and we fledged out over 80 birds this summer. 80 birds? Yeah. Besides all the birds and the bees, the more closely we looked, the more we discovered that their reclamation program really was working. Jacob stepped in some deer droppings. We saw plenty of tracks too. See, we planted this clover here to stabilize the soil, but the rabbits and the deer love it. Their plantings also attracted small rodents and even some turkeys. And get this, some of the guys at the mine even spotted bears on the site. Oh my. In case you guys haven't noticed, it's getting late and you missed the last thing on your list. And it's pretty important, especially if you live there. You still need to find out about the social impact. You know, what it's like to live your life near that place. It's a small town. See, see what you can find out. Tunnel City might be small, but they make up for it in warmth. After sundown, we got invited to a neighborhood marshmallow roast, where we finally got to meet some of the local kids. Oh, they knew why we were there investigating the mine, but they still shared their opinions about living right across the road from it. They talked about when the community first heard of the mine coming in. Most people were naturally afraid of possible noise, water, and air pollution. But after the mine started up, they eventually found out the same stuff we did. It kind of hasn't affected the people as much that uh, people thought it would. I think we hear more cars on the highway than we do at the mine, so it's not that big of a deal. Hmm, these kids turned out to be pretty perceptive. They even surprised us when they explained the difference between a mine being near a community and this mine actually playing an active role in their community. It has uh, benefited most people more than they thought. It has certainly uh, helped out the community. The mine has, I think, has brought the community more closer together with, uh, I know they did an open house a couple weeks ago. And they also have uh, family days there where the employees, families can go out and have a tour and after the tour is done they can take pictures of all the equipment and have a nice meal at the end of it too. And I think it also gives the community a name for itself. Then there was the obvious one, jobs. For their moms and dads to support their families and with a really short commute. They also talked about working at the mine themselves someday, many wanting the same jobs as their parents. And finally, with everyone crowded near the fire, it told plenty about something you can't find everywhere. Close friends who live really close. That's pretty cool. So we found out that we need industrial sand in our lives. That's clear. And we need someone to mine it and process it. Hopefully it will be high-tech miners like the ones here in Tunnel City. And if you really think about it, we could learn a few things from what they do here in Tunnel City. Yeah. What a concept, using technology, engineering, and a development plan to consider both the environment and towns like this. Environmentally, it kind of makes me see the light at the <laughs> end of the tunnel. Here. Eat a marshmallow. organizations have provided funding for this Into the Outdoors television series.